Ryan at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, SVB Silicon Valley Bank suffers its worst ever intraday drop as the CEO begs clients to stay calm. What this reflects about startups, about venture capital firms and tech-focused lenders. And the chat platform Discord turns to, you've guessed it, OpenAI to look at integrating AI into the platform. We'll discuss. Then the Fed creates a crypto oversight team to overlook stablecoins. We discuss with the co-founder of DM Stablecoin Program. But first, let's check in on the markets because what a down day. What a worry that we're getting surrounding lenders, banks in general, and of course, a lot of those are tech-focused in nature. NASDAQ off by 2%. KBW Bank Index. I shine a light on this index because the banking index is having its worst day since June of 2020, off by 7.7%. And it's all regarding SVB and indeed Silvergate. I look at a 10-year Treasury yield that gets bid. This risk-off sentiment means money pours back in to U.S. Treasuries. Yields drop by eight basis points. Let's move it on. Let's look at the world of crypto because the worry, the contagion, the implications of a Silvergate unwinding and indeed what SVB really talks about in terms of risk sentiment around technology. Crypto absolutely being battered after the liquidation of Silvergate. We're off by more than right. 8%. And Ed, just dig into that a little bit for us. The implications of what now feels traditional finance meets decentralized finance. Look, look, certainly sentiment depressed all day long when it comes to Bitcoin as an example because of Silvergate. There's also some stuff out there about Hubi and KuCoin um, and what the New York Attorney General is looking at. But here are the concerns, right? SVB Financial, parent group of Silicon Valley Bank, down 60 percent. Silvergate Capital, down 42 percent. The concern here is that the impact of higher rates has hit the frothiest corners of the market. Where are the frothiest corners of the market, Caroline? Crypto and technology. The story with SVB in particular is that who are their clients? Their clients are technology companies, startups who are facing cash burn. They don't need cash in the bank. They need it at hand. So they're making basically withdrawals, deposit outflows, and Silicon Valley Bank is having to react in order to plug the gap. Just to make the point even further, let's look yeah. at this terminal chart really quick and just look at the drama. Biggest drop on record for this stock and its lowest level since September 2016. Let's get more details. Bloomberg Shanali Basak joining us out in New York. A lot of stories to cover. But how core is that Silicon Valley bank client base tech to this story? Uh, it is a big part of this story, but you can also talk about balance sheet management here being an issue when it comes to Silicon Valley Bank. When you look at the Wall Street view on what has happened here, part of the issues were exacerbated not just because of their client base, but because they had to sell securities at a loss. That is something we're not seeing just unique to Silicon Valley Bank. But I want to put some context here because the point you're making here, this not so long ago, a year ago, this bank was the envy of the industry of many, many banks. From Goldman Sachs to J.P. Morgan, they loved what Silicon Valley Bank was doing. To the point that you have to wonder now, is Silicon Valley Bank going to eventually become an acquisition target? Or is there too much weakness here to make it so? What happens next, I think, is the major question that's looming in the market for Silicon Valley Bank. And I think some of the threads that we're going to weave, and I in no way want to imply that SVB's stock drop immediately means that we're going to see what happened with Silvergate. But ultimately, two companies, two banks, are currently facing the headwinds of higher interest rates and both got very focused on certain parts of the market. Yeah, and that is certainly what is in common here. And by the way, there are other banks that also have similar worries around them. Think Signature Bank, where the deposit base was not so loaded to crypto, about 15 percent, according to analyst estimates, of its deposits were kind of tied to the crypto industry yeah. more broadly. But Signature, 90 percent through September were really tied of its deposits to the crypto industry. So the point you're making, the issues in crypto are not the same as all the issues in technology. But what you're seeing here is this exposure to the industry more broadly becoming a worry for firms like this. I will say one other thing. Remember, concurrently, they also announced a capital raise. Yes. This is a market in which the reasons in which you're raising capital are very, very, very sensitive. And that is another thing. This is a concept of dilution and why you're raising money uh, is a big warning sign for anybody raising money ahead. Certainly saw that being really shown out through the KBW Bank Index performance today. We really want to thank Shanali Basak in the moment for all things weaving together what is happening with the likes of SVB, but also what happened with Silvergate. And we want to dig into Silvergate and crypto a little bit more now with Avalabs president, John Wu. John, 
we turn to you for your expertise because you have announcements to make. You are still building in a space, but ultimately, you are currently a man who is trying to digitize the entire and ultimately trying to digitize world's assets for traditional finance, for asset managers. How hard is that when we see Silvergate having to unwind? Well, clearly, it's going to be a lot harder when all the intermediaries and seemingly all the intermediaries and the on ramps for institutions and individuals into the crypto ecosystem are one by one getting removed, um, either through regulation, through bad actors, through risk management, bad fundamentals like in the Silvergate case. So it's not easy, it makes it harder, but you continue to build and continue to get partnerships. John, you're operating in, in an ecosystem, in an industry that, that still wants to build, have access to capital, needs banking services. Just very quickly, give us some insight into the conversations you're having with industry peers about Silvergate, about what this industry is going through right now. So when things uh, get better, the issue is if there are no on-ramps, no intermediaries to help new institutions come into the space, that'll delay the growth of the space. The other problem is even healthy balance sheets in the space, they need little things, banking services. Like crypto is a fintech business and legitimate businesses need banking services to pay people to do things that every other company does. If we remove the banks that help these companies do that, you're removing companies' desire to be onshore and they, unfortunately US companies will move offshore for banking services and other things that they need to just operate. Caroline, I just want to go back to the point you and I are making at the top of the show, right, which is if you put Silvergate side by side with SVB, what do they have in common? It's a discussion around what the impact of higher rates has been on froth. Where is the froth? It's in crypto and it's in technology more broadly. We're just seeing a delayed reaction, it seems. And SVB well, I actually, having to If come, I may, go, I've John. seen this a couple oh, of times it, yeah. in my career, because my first part of my career was in the financial markets. Every time the Fed raises rates, things break. Mm. And the first things that break are usually the bad actors and the frauds. And then at the tail end of that, bad risk management, bad fundamentally yeah. uh, driven companies break. So if there's a silver lining here is now we're at layer two. Yeah. And then when things stabilize, hopefully we go back to a stable environment. John, are regulators turning to you for advice? They should. I was down in D.C. and talking to senators and talking to other agencies. Our, um, our general counsels constantly down there talking. I think we need to open up a healthy dialogue. Um, it can't be just one way. And if that happens, you'll bring a lot of the capital markets back and a lot of the innovation back. Otherwise, like I've been saying, things are going to continue to move offshore because the certainty in rules and regulations is happening in Europe, is happening actually even in Asia. What's so fascinating is, of course, at the same time as we worry about Silvergate's implications, we think about what's happening with Silicon Valley Bank at the moment, its exposure to technology, to startups. John, just want to bring our audience some breaking news that, interestingly, the Founders Fund, which a key VC player is advising that com its own companies should withdraw funds from Silicon Valley Bank. Now, we know the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank has been out there trying to reassure clients as to what the stock drop means, what the conservation of its capital at the moment is trying to signify but ultimately we are going to see some concerns being built if founders fund are indeed advising their own portfolio companies to withdraw funds from svb can i ask you as a founder john do you have money in traditional finance do you have money with silicon valley bank well silicon valley bank is one of the banks that we use um as well as some of the other ones that were mentioned so i think the right thing the prudent thing we've learned is counterparty risk once these things start. This is a classic bank run. And when the bank run starts, you don't want to be the last guy there and wondering what happened. Unfortunately, this is the way banks work. They rely on trust. When they lose that trust, um, bad things really will happen. John, so I, we, I know we have so much to discuss about Ava so and, and what's happening with Avalanche, but, but we, we have to stick with this story because it's happening before our eyes. What mm. do you do in this situation? Do you follow the advice of names in the Valley like Founders Fund and pull the money? Do you stick with it? I mean, they, they, I have to just point out, there were a number of names that Bloomberg cited in its reporting that said what we're seeing in Silicon Valley Bank is not the same as Silvergate and actually long term, they have a, a completely solid future. What would you do in this circumstance? Well, hopefully there's enough. What I would do is you have to diversify out. 
and maybe not pull everything, but pull some. Have um, you, we John? experienced this back in the great financial crisis where you had to diversify your prime brokers. Luckily, we have already diversified, so we're less exposed than we were literally just a few weeks or months ago. Okay, and I, I think ultimately you're going to continue to dig to ask questions. Has it been easy to gain that sort of information from Silicon Valley Bank at the moment, or are you reply, relying on analyst reports that we get and indeed some of the reporting coming from our own journalists? Uh, you're relying on your own interactions. The operator always has a better view. Um, you know, the cadence of responses and how things are working, the, the size of transactions, all of those little subtle hints is what we're relying on as an operator. Um, by the time you read it in the news or something, unfortunately, it's probably a little bit late. I, I just want to ask a little bit. Of course, you are there trying to ensure that your banking is secure, that where your money is put, that your business is on solid footing. And I'm sure you have done it. As you said, you've already diversified. You're also diversifying your business. And just very briefly, John, we brought you on the show because you've done this new deal. You're bringing Web3 to gaming in particular. How hard is that to sign these new sort of documents, get on board the likes of TSM and Blitzapp when people are questioning the overall Web3 trajectory? Great question. And that's the fun part, by the way. Um, it, no doubt it's harder, and especially with U.S. companies. Uh, but the cadence in foreign companies is actually happening. In this TSM case, just so people know, this is one of the largest gaming franchises. The TSM is the equivalent of an esports team. It's like the Yankees for esports. And they're going to provide their gamers with some of the requests the gamers want, which is to uh, get more liquidity for their in-game items through an Avalanche-based wallet. Right now, the way the world works is gamers have closed loose systems where they buy in-game assets on one place, but they can't sell and move to another very quickly, or they have to pay large fees to convert back to U.S. dollars. So they're going to cre create a wallet on Avalanche where all these different games will have interoperability and make their lives better. John, we'll continue the conversation on the partnership with Blitz. TSM going forward. There's something happening here right now in global Silicon Valley, and we're grateful for your insight on it. Other Labs president, John Wu, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, coming up, now coming up, Discord gets on the OpenAI bandwagon. Is that a surprise? Expanding its own AI offerings. We're going to talk all about that development next. This is Bloomberg. chat GPT effect. We have this thing called Erica, which is a virtual artificial intelligence, virtual assistant, natural language processing, predictive technology that we've been running for four or five years and 18 million customers use it 145, 150 million times a quarter. So we're used to it, but this is now a new one that could change the game. Bank of America CEO there, Brian Moynihan. And well, let's stick with CEOs who love all things AI, because messaging platform Discord just announced its expansion of its own AI offerings, including, guess what, OpenAI's technology. They're incorporating into functions like its chatbot, its moderation systems. Let's bring in Bloomberg Cecilia Adenastasio, who has the story at an event. Just tell us about where they think this will be additive. Sure. So Discord is a chat app that 150 million people use every single month to discuss everything from video games to anime to classical music. And now Discord is integrating OpenAI's chat GPT technology, which creates kind of human-like conversations using AI um, into one of its bots. The bot's name is Clyde, and Clyde has existed for a long time. It's kind of Discord's mascot. But now Clyde will be able to tell users things like the weather or a time in another country or even suggest a playlist for a Discord server using AI chat technology. 
All right, Bloomberg Cecilia D. Anastasio, thank you so much for your reporting. Caroline, I've got to bring you some more breaking news headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Our source is now telling us that Y Combinator is advising uh, its companies in its portfolios to limit their exposure to SVB Financial. Y Combinator, the latest name, according to sources, follows Founders Fund just in the last 20 minutes. Those after-hour declines on Silicon Valley Bank or SVB Financial Group now really accelerating down 6% or so. We'll continue to track the names that are adding to this story blow by blow. We're going to get back to generative AI, though, and let's keep talking about this with Dion Nicholas, who's the CEO and co-founder of Forfort, to generative AI company for customer support automation, which, guess what, Caro? They also recently announced integration of open AI technology with the launch of their own support GPT platform. I saw you smiling. Absolutely, Ed. I'm super excited well, to be here. Let me ask you this. Why? Why open AI? Why not your own tech? Yeah, absolutely. Well, to, to clarify, Forethought's been around for four or five years now, applying AI to help customers and help businesses serve their customers better. And so with Support GPT, we're launching today the world's first generative AI platform for customer support automation. The real big thing and the real answer to why by now is that in November, ChatGPT changed the name of the game for the customer experience and for consumer expectations. We've been building for four or five years and we've been very focused on correctness, very focused on building a generation of AI that actually can help customers solve their problems. And what we're seeing now is that it's become mainstream for consumers and that experience, that expectation has risen with ChatGPT. And so we've combined that and we're building out and we're launching support GPT for customer support. So this is not a marketing exercise or a PR stunt? No, absolutely not. And that's one of the things that we wanted to be sure about here is true to our nature, it's about solving problems for our customers. We actually already have customers betaing and using our support GPT platform. Folks like Upwork, the world's largest talent marketplace, um, are already leveraging this technology in production. Caro, we, uh, as we do every day, we asked our audience what they think about just endless announcements of partnerships between tech companies and, uh, and open AI. You know the results as well as I do, Caroline. Uh, respondents think this is a PR stunt, broadly, what we're seeing right now in the industry. Yeah, and meanwhile, Dion, you say, look, this isn't, this is about servicing your clients. I I'm just really interested in, help me understand here, you're already a leading generative AI company. You're already building your own large language model. What was it that OpenAI has that ultimately you couldn't build in-house? So most customers, when they interact with customer support, they don't necessarily want to chit-chat. They want their problems solved, first and foremost. And that was the premise that we launched Forethought on all of those years ago, was to use AI to help people to solve their problems. One of the things that people have seen with ChatGPT, hundreds of millions of people have used it from writers to bakers uh, to friends, family, mm -hmm. everything. They have now seen what it's like to interact with a chatbot that's empathetic, that's human-like, that really raises the game and raises the name for customer experience. And that was one of the things that we saw and our customers saw. We actually, I started getting texts from heads of customer support saying, hey, our customers want this kind of experience and we're betting on forethought. And that was actually the spark that actually helped us to realize, hey, there is actually something new here. There is not, it is not just a publicity stunt. It is not just, you know, the next fad. It is technology. And we at Forethought have been all in on AI since day one. Um, and so we are staying. We've always been on the forefront. The expectations from customers have risen, and we're, we're rising and we're launching Support GPT to go and meet those expectations and bring customers that next level of customer support. Who's your competition then, Dion? Because we're seeing other key companies that are very close to supporting salespeople, supporting other areas of, of client-facing individuals, and they're also using OpenAI. Yeah, the, the big competitor for us, quite frankly, is the legacy chatbot. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of legacy chatbots that have cropped up over the last decade or so of, uh, of innovation. And one of the things that you notice about chatbots is that, one, we've all experienced them, and we've all found that they are super clunky. Right? They're manual, they're decision tree based, and they're more artificial than they are intelligent. And so we've set out to actually really 
tr uh, transform the way customer service is done. And it's really that host of chatbot companies that we're trying to um, out innovate and that we've been out innovating over the past few years. Yeah, we've got to go to some, some more of this breaking news right around Silicon Valley Bank. Can I just, for our audience, ask, are you a customer or client of Silicon Valley Bank? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank is one of the banks we actually use here at Forthought. We obviously work with uh, a few uh, banks, so um, it's, it's interesting hearing the news go out live uh, these days. So uh, really interesting. Thanks. We, we don't want to put you on the spot, but you, I think you appreciate why we have to ask those questions, Absolutely. right, Caroline, that this yeah. is happening before our eyes. Yeah, and ultimately, I have to ask you more on the spot, therefore, Dion. Are you going to be thinking about your relationship with SVB? We're seeing that the shares are extending their post-market decline down by more than 10% at the moment, and a lot of venture capitalists, and I know you're backed by VC, asking their portfolio companies to cut their ties. Well, it's a really dynamic situation. Uh, we're definitely evolving and uh, adapting as we go. Um, but what I can say is, you know, again, we work with multiple banks here at Forethought. Um, and our goal at the end of the day is to best serve our customers, which is, again, why we're launching this uh, support GPT. Um, but again, there's a lot happening in the space. And uh, yeah, we're, we're excited and watching what's going on. Excited for AI, watching what's going on with SVB. We'll let you go and get attention exactly. to both of those things. Dion Nicholas, we thank you, CEO and co-founder of Forethought and all things AI and indeed Silicon Valley Bank. Let's bring you where the market is currently telling the concern is at, and it's in Silicon Valley Bank's parent company. We're currently off by more than 10% after hours as you break the news, Ed, that we are seeing yet further moves coming from Y Combinator advising its companies to limit SVB exposure at the moment. And indeed, we'd already heard it from the Founders Fund advising its companies to withdraw funds from SVB. We remind our viewers they currently bank about 40% of all US VC-backed companies, according to its own website. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. does business with nearly half of all venture-backed companies in the United States, said Silicon Valley Bank, the parent company, falling further after hours after, of course, it warned the market earlier today that it's having to shore up its own capital, selling off assets, doing a share sale, and ultimately now seeing, wow. despite this sort wow. of talk of confidence, the ultimate depositor is moving away from them. VCs are advising their portfolio companies to cut ties. Yeah, look, look, this is really accelerating after hours. We're down 17% now. We haven't even got to the reporting that, according to a source, Greg Becker, the CEO of the bank, held a call with VCs earlier today, basically saying keep calm. Yeah. A lot more to come with this story, Karen. Thus far, not keeping calm. We currently see, of course, Founders Fund and Y Combinator advising their portfolio companies to consider ending their relationships with Silicon Valley Bank. So much more on this story. This is Bloomberg. Want to know how tough it is out there for startups? Look no further than Silicon Valley Bank. Now, as the name might suggest, it's a lender to venture-backed startups. And, well, it's just announced the trouble that it's in. Its shares have plummeted, the parent company of it, the most since 1998. Why is it struggling? Well, because the companies that it banks, those startups, currently are struggling to get new funding. They are burning through cash and therefore they're having to withdraw some of their deposits. So QSVB having to sell more shares, having to sell off some of its asset portfolio and ultimately trying to shore up its own capital position. This just comes one day after the crypto focused lender Silvergate announced that it was winding down, that it was liquidating after its own customers had to withdraw deposits because crypto prices tumbled. Look, what is to blame here? interest rates. They're rising as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates to tackle inflation. Suddenly, boring old safe US government bonds look pretty appetizing. They actually give you some yield. So why take a riskier bet on a crypto company or a startup that may or may not pay off? This ultimately is the end of free money. It means that valuations are sinking and it's hurting certain lenders and companies that bet everything on these tech and crypto sectors. 
Look, let's get more into this unravelling story as the shares continue to drop after hours for Silicon Valley Bank. We've got Bloomberg's Max Reyes, who's been across this story. And just talk to us ultimately, now it seems to be the venture capitalists who were getting the calls from the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank to calm and stay calm, are now not staying calm and telling their portfolio companies to cut ties. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. I think, again, the thing to keep in mind is what the interest rate environment is doing to these banks that decided to really push into particular sectors. Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate have a lot of differences. Uh, obviously, Silicon Valley Bank has been building out this specific franchise for decades, while Silvergate's push into crypto is relatively more recent. But the similarity is that they took a bet on a very, very specific sector of the U.S. economy. And as interest rates continue to climb, as you know, they're the areas that they focused on, their backyards, as it were, sort of dried up, they've been forced to reckon with that. Obviously, that led to Silvergate to make the decision to wind down. We're still seeing how this is playing out for Silicon Valley Bank. Right. But clearly, clients and investors are, are worried. Uh, Max, to recap the reporting, uh, $21 billion off their securities portfolio. They're selling at a loss. According to a source, Greg Becker met with venture capitalists and clients to kind of reassure them what's going on. I do want to show what Greg Becker had to say today about the actions that Silicon Valley Bank's taken. We're taking these actions because we expect to continue higher interest rates, pressured public and private markets, and elevated cash burn levels from our clients as they invest in their business. You reported that actually in the market, many do not believe that this situation with Silicon Valley, Valley Bank is the same as with Silvergate. Explain that to us. Correct. And again, it goes back to this idea of the franchises being different in terms of their value and in terms of what is happening, right? Uh, I would say that folks expect Silicon Valley Bank to have more kind of more strength in its franchise because they've been doing this longer, right? They have more capabilities as a bank, while Silvergate wasn't really interested in being a bank by any traditional sense, right? Silvergate's value was that it was, A, willing to touch crypto or at least fiat currency from crypto clients, and that it was giving them a way to exchange with those funds with each other as part of their trading activity, which is not really, you know, something the normal course of banking. While Silicon Valley Bank, even though it likewise took a very narrow approach, does use both sides of its balance sheet. You know, it does lending, it does deposit taking. It's not just trying to game one side of it or the other. So that's why folks are kind of rooting for them and expecting them to pull through this with more confidence than they did Silvergate. Let's therefore talk about next steps, Max. What do you look for to ensure that Silicon Valley Bank can weather this current storm? The fundamental question going forward is going to be how many more of these clients opt to pull uh, their deposits, how many more withdrawals we see, and how that affects the bank's uh, capitalization. What ended up killing Silvergate, right, was the fact that even though it could honor the withdrawals it was seeing, it was no longer as capitalized as well as it had been due to that, right? And there are various ratio, capital ratios and so on you need to satisfy as a regulated financial institution. So that was one of the key sort of issues uh, affecting Silvergate going into it. Again, uh, investors, people who watch the market, see key differences between Silvergate and Silicon Valley Bank. But that is what people will be looking for. How will the franchise fare as this continues? Bloomberg's Max Reyes, terrific reporting. I think this is probably just the start of this story. We'll track it in the days to come. Now, let's get to the world of crypto kind of more broadly. Today, the Fed announced plans to form a crypto oversight team. This as Fed Vice Chair for Supervision, Michael Barr, discussed the impact of stable coins on the financial system. Have a listen. Consider the consequences if a stablecoin not subject to appropriate supervision and regulation were to be adopted as a widespread means of payment, which some stablecoin developers state as a goal. Stablecoins have the potential to scale quickly because of network effects. An unregulated, unsupervised deposit-like asset could create tremendous disruptions, not just for financial institutions, but for people who might rely on the coin if it were to get wide adoption. 
Let's talk about the network effects of stablecoins with Morgan Bella. She's the co-founder of Facebook's DM stablecoin program, but also partner at NFX, a VC focused on network effects, $1.1 billion of deployed capital assets under management. You heard there what the Fed vice chair had to say. Are you convinced by it? Thank you so much for having me. And yes, at NFX, which stands for network effects on the board, we are believers in network effects. As a creator of DM, I'm a believer in stablecoins. So hearing Michael Barr acknowledge stablecoins in that way, I'm trying to stay net optimistic, but I am admittedly a bit nervous that oversight could maybe go too far. I don't necessarily see network effects and these assets taking off quickly as a bad thing, which definitely feels like he's coming at it with a negative tone. And of course, that was the ultimate demise of DM when it had to sell itself, I have to say, it ended up selling itself to the likes of Silvergate Bank in and of itself, some of the assets, because they had to be, it went on into unwind because ultimately they didn't feel the regulatory environment was ready for that. What are you hoping to hear from regulators that they do indeed recognize ultimately the importance of stable coins? Because you've written an essay on this. I did write an essay on this. Thank you for reading it or commenting on it. I'm hoping to hear that the U.S. government recognizes that stable coins are a huge asset. So dollarization is an effort that the U.S. government has been trying to push for over 200 years and not necessarily in scalable ways. Like the U.S. government to this day backs up physical trucks of cash into villages around the world. If you believe that the future of money is more digital than it is physical, stable coins are a real tool to further push dollarization, which as an American is pretty awesome. And not all stable coins are created equally. I've said there's you know 50 shades of stable coins, but there are what we coined as safe, safe stable coins, which we define as assets with digital representations of actual dollars. So let's say a safe digital US dollar has a physical US dollar in a bank account somewhere. Mm. And the US government should see that as a great tool. So I'm hoping that the US government realizes that stable coins are really not an issue or matter of crypto first. It's really an issue and matter of dollarization and U.S. hegemony first. Yeah. Financial services second, and crypto is just kind of the infrastructure on which it's built. But when you hear, of course, Barr saying they scale quickly due to network effects, and he warned that, therefore, if they go unchecked, ultimately there's a risk there, a tremendous risk. Is the risk really, ultimately, for him that, well, it gets bigger than non-digital cryptocurrency? I really just want to shake him. <laughs> if he's listening, I'd love to shake you. So um, <laughs> we'll message him. The risk, yes, thank you. The risk where I will admit and see a risk is that there are 50 shades of stable coins, as I mentioned, and they're not all, quote, safe in that people are using the three letters USD and tacking it on to various assets, which could be misleading to consumers. And the onus is on the consumer to do the homework on their own to decide if, you know, this version of digital USD is safe, is this one not, et cetera. But if right. they are regulated, for which there are some issuers, for which there are actual physical dollars, like at least one in a bank account for every digital version, like if that takes off quickly, like I don't, that could be a good thing. Like again, the US government has been trying to push dollar hegemony for 200 years and not quick and scalable ways. And this could really, really be a great tool for that. Morgan, DM, uh, the association's assets sold to Silvergate. You were co-founder of, of DM. What is your reaction to what you're seeing happen with Silvergate? It's all kind of disbelief. So I was not at DM for, I left right around when that sale was being negotiated, so I wasn't there for that. But I will say that I was, even though DM did not take off or succeed in the ways that we had hoped and dreamed, I was excited to see the assets live on with the hope that another entity, you know, not Facebook, would potentially help bring these ideas to life. So it is a bummer to see that not be the case with Silvergate. But yes. we're a great partner at the time, and they like we were happy to find the home. But it's all kind of surreal. Morgan, we have to ask as well, the other big piece of breaking news is SVB Financial Silicon Valley Bank. Are you a deposit client of that bank? We're showing a chart on the screen, biggest drop on record um, this Thursday. 
I have a friend visiting who got to the office today and was like, you didn't tell me the sky would be falling. And I thought he was referencing it raining in San Francisco, but he was referencing Silicon Valley Bank. So definitely still in shock and awe there. NFX is a client of SVB, to be honest. They've been a great partner to us as they've been a great partner to everyone else in Silicon Valley and the broader tech world. And they've really been a pillar of yeah. industry in a really positive way to date. So this is deeply upsetting to see. We don't know much. We're watching it like everyone else is watching it. Mm. And as information unfolds, you know, advising both the portfolio and ourselves accordingly. But Morgan, nothing. will you have to ultimately advise your portfolio clients, even if they are a great partner, to sever their links to pull their deposits? No, that's like the multi-billion dollar question of the day. We, if we do feel that it is unsafe and puts our companies at risk, we will do so. But we, what would be the tell for that? What would be the signal that you then think it's unsafe? The biggest question that we're asking is how will, will this impact our portfolio companies from operating their businesses in the day to day? And I don't think we're worried about everything vanishing, you know, overnight, but we are worried about our companies being able to access work and capital that they need to run their businesses today, tomorrow, and over the next few months. So it's unclear exactly what the objective sign is that we are looking for, but that's kind of the question we're looking to answer. Morgan, thank you so much for coming on, for talking all things crypto, all things traditional finance, and being so clear with us. We appreciate it. NFX partner, Morgan Bella. Thank you. Coming up, Walmart. Well, it's narrowing the gap with Amazon for wealthier online shoppers. We'll dig into it next. This is Bloomberg. Walmart Plus. It launched in 2020 and it's beginning to creep into the crucial demographic dominated by Amazon Prime, wealthy shoppers. New data shows that the share of Walmart Plus subscribers with an income of above $150,000 actually rose 13% in the past year alone. But it is a long way to catch up to Amazon Prime's 77% control of the demographic. Let's get to Spencer Soper, who covers all things e-commerce for us. And ultimately, there is a flywheel effect going on here. Yeah, so uh, Walmart Plus launched in 2020, and it's starting to pick up some steam. And what we are seeing is, just like Amazon early on, back in 2005 when it launched Prime, the whole prospect there was let's offer really good selection, really good prices, bring in more customers, yeah. and, and it all feeds on itself. And we're starting to see some of that with, with Walmart. But uh, the, the real interesting thing was these more affluent shoppers, that, that they're getting uh, more people in that 150000 plus a year annual income uh, area right. that you'd normally associate with Amazon. And we're starting to see Walmart get more of them. All right, Bloomberg, Spencer Soper, terrific reporting. Thank you very much. Now, coming up, an exclusive look inside South Korea's space program, which has its eyes on challenging the likes of NASA, but also SpaceX. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. South Korea is pushing to be a major player in space exploration by 2045. With treaties that are limiting tech capabilities, South Korea's rocket scientists turned to the Internet to find an engine that they could mimic. Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel got exclusive access to South Korea's rocket launch program. Have a listen. South Korea has lofty goals for its fledgling space program that needed one giant leap of faith in a search engine to get it off the ground. 
Treaties between established space powers like the U.S., Russia, and France prohibit certain tech transfers to aspiring space club nations like South Korea, leaving its small team of pioneering rocket scientists to scour the web for ideas. We looked up on the internet to compare and find a suitable launch vehicle. What caught our eye was the SpaceX Falcon Merlin engine. We developed Nuri, looking at the picture and using it as a point of reference to design. Kerosene is a fuel tank. This is an actual Nuri three-stage launch vehicle, not a replica. And Bloomberg News got an exclusive and unprecedented tour of the entire Naro Space Center, where the first two Nuri rockets were launched, including the first successful test mission last year. What did you feel when it launched for the first time? Ah, oh, my heart is beating fast too. <laughs> and praying, please. Pray, pray. The next launch, perhaps by as early as this May, will deploy actual commercial satellites, powered into orbit by those SpaceX-inspired but locally made engines and their nearly 300 tons of thrust. We're trying to build a SpaceX-like company. It's a model that marries Elon Musk's cost efficiencies with South Korea's prowess in advanced chips. At present, the Nuri costs about 80 million U.S. dollars per launch, compared to 67 million for the more powerful, larger payload Falcon 9. That's largely why later this year, South Korea's government-run Kari will transfer its commercial rocket launching to a private company, rocket engine maker Hanwha Aerospace. We're seeking to see if Hanwha can make this Nuri rocket profitable, but it's a very hard task. Elon Musk has made a very <laughs> tight market for other companies. This is South Korea's main launch center and launch pad for the last two Nuri rockets and the next one that will be launched sometime later in 2023. But over here, they're going to expand it because they have larger ambitions for destinations further afield, including the moon and beyond. And liftoff of Artemis 1. Namely, participation in the NASA-led Artemis program to return man and payloads to the moon. National security, too, will be a key driver at a time when North Korea is improving its rocket capabilities and a sanctioned Russia means one less rocket launch provider available to South Korea. It's important to find cheap launch vehicles from a business perspective, but I think it is very important for the country to have the ability to put satellites or things like this into space when we want to. To get into the once fairly exclusive but now increasingly crowded Global Space Club, South Korea may emulate another American accomplishment, the Kennedy Space Center, to transform these sleepy islands in the nation's south into an aerospace industry epicenter. Stephen Engel, Bloomberg News at the Naro Space Center, Gohong, South Korea. From South Korea and space to the here and now on the ground when it comes to financials, let's look at Silicon Valley Bank still tumbling after hours after, of course, there's concern about companies starting to pull their deposits yet further from this particular lender. Hannah Miller is with us and, of course, a key component of lending to VC-backed U.S. companies. We're down now more than 20 percent. What are you hearing from some of the venture capital companies? Yeah, so we know that there's a lot of concern among venture capitalists. We know firms are pulling funds from Silvergate and advising their portfolio companies to do the same. From uh, SVB? From SVB, yes, that's correct. Um, we know that there was a call this morning where SVB CEO advised clients, which included venture capitalists, to remain calm. He said this multiple times. Um, but still, there's a lot of concern here. Um, and this is a developing story that we're keeping close tabs on. Just give us a sense of size and scope. Basically, most of Silicon Valley uses this as their banking of choice. Yes, this is a key component in si Silicon Valley. We know venture capitalists gravitate towards this bank. We have big names connected to Silicon Valley Bank. And ultimately, Hannah, we're hearing, you know, Greg Becker, the CEO, is saying, you know, stay calm. But when you've got Founders Fund, of course, co-founded by Peter Thiel, saying that there's no downside to removing your deposits, when you've got Y Combinator perhaps advising their companies to do the same, feels like this is going to be a crescendo effect. Yes, that's what we're keeping tabs on. People are nervous. Um, yes, they're being told to stay calm, but that seems to be sparking even more anxiety among investors. So we have portfolio companies on edge. We have VCs on edge. Uh, this is a very intense story. Very, very quickly, what do we not know? What's still to find out? 
Uh, we need. We are certain that more people are pulling funds from SVP. Um, we don't know what's going to happen here in terms of getting them, you know, right side up. We of course put out our feelers, and we are in constant conversation with Silicon Valley Bank, and we'll bring you any up to date information from that particular lender. But Hannah Miller, we thank you so much. And that does it from this edition of a very breaking news heavy Bloomberg Technology. Yeah, tomorrow, Twitter spaces, 12 Eastern, 9 AM Pacific. I know what you and I are going to be talking about. This is erupted into a huge story around Silicon Valley Bank. This is Bloomberg.